find it. We have a very special guest tonight, as we always do. But I'm going to tell you, this lady is a trailblazer for us gals. And when I first met her, I immediately gravitated toward her. And I knew I need to know her better. I could learn a thing or two from this gal. And so guess what? We have met. And now she has so kindly agreed to be on the Find It Show. So I'm going to talk a lot about her when she's here with us. So first, we're going to roll her video intro, and she will be right back with us. Mary Tabor. Hello. Wow, that was amazing. What a beautiful intro you did. Oh, uh, and you are amazing. So, and the my producer made the video. She's very techy like that. So thanks to Lynn for making that for us. But but I've I've been talking about you for a long time to my friends and family because Mary, there is and it, every time I say this, it makes me laugh because you know that that slapstick humor. Um movie called something about mary oh yes <laughs> so oh, every goodness. time i say i don't know there's just something about mary then i think of um that 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 movie that was so funny but anyway there is something about you and it's because of your um your grit your drive your determination confidence and you're just quite frankly a badass woman oh well i have to tell you something about you uh, something you put in in the promo and I think it was on Facebook, and it put me in charge of affairs. What an interesting intro for me. I was at this uh, this lobbying organization, and apparently I was in charge of affairs. And now I'm not sure what to make of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Well, um, I, I think I, you, left, you left out a word. <laughs> I, I I know. I know. So shoot, maybe I need a producer for that, too. But, you know, I just, I, I reading about you, I mean, I've met you. You know, we, you and I met virtually. And yes. I was like, Oh my gosh, she is amazing. And then when I was in LA, I stayed a couple of extra days and I was able to meet you in person. And you so graciously, you and Dell, your husband had me at your home. And I was just like, wow, you know, we sat and we talked and I felt like it was just two old friends. It just immediately felt comfortable. And I just thought, gosh, I mean, she's going to be my friend for the rest of my life. I, I, I so appreciated what you have to offer. And I truly mean it when I say it. I think I can learn a thing or two from you. Oh, I don't know about that. I do. I, and can I, you just talk about your hair? Like, everybody, look at this lady. I mean, is she so fabulous? So fabulous. So, you know, let's get into it for everybody. So, yeah, we met. I'm going to get into that a little bit more about how I was at your home and you hosted me so well with a charcuterie board and a nice glass of wine. And we just sat back and visited and it was lovely. But I want to talk about I, I kind of want to start off with your first marriage and your children. <laughs> and and then we can always backtrack if we want and go different places in conversation. But I want us to kind of talk like we did when we were at your home. Sure. Um, yes. It's just we have a lot of listeners that's then on the combo. Okay, yeah. So, so I, I get married when I'm about, oh, what was I, about 22 years old, a little too young, I'd say. And um, I marry this guy who seems to me to be a real dreamboat. And uh, he's, he's a good guy. I mean, I'm not saying that he's not a good guy, but let's just say that um, he kind of liked to fool around. Yeah. And uh, the fooling around sort of got to me when I found out about it, uh, especially when I found out that it was his secretary and her name was Mary. Oh. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, well, he's not going to mix up the names at least, right? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. Yes. Oh, no. but we, have two, we, have, we, we did have together two beautiful children, and I will never regret that, and I'll never regret the time I was a stay-at-home mom. 
And all of that time that I was a stay-at-home mom, I was trying to figure out a way that I could write. Mm -hmm. I just really, that's what I really wanted to do. But yeah, you know, we, we marry young, we make mistakes, yeah. and then we need to mm -hmm. find our way through. Right. And so what happened? How did you, in that, that place, you have two children, yep. small children, you'd been a stay home mother yes. and, and you, you find yourself now in a, a marriage that isn't working any longer. What did you do? The first thing I did was probably not the smartest thing to do. I looked for a job. I, it, it, this is a long time ago when women could have alimony and be promised to be supported by their exes. But instead, I think, I think things are falling apart. I better find a way to make sure that my kids are going to be okay and that I'm going to be okay. And so I go looking for a job and I, I find one. And I, well, actually it was a hard process because I was a teacher originally, and I taught at Towson High School in Baltimore, and I love that. When I went looking for a job and thought, I'm thinking, I'm not sure how this is going to work out, so I don't know what I can afford to do. So I'm trying to look at private schools first. And in, 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 in the District of Columbia, and, and I was living in Washington, D.C. then, in the District of Columbia, there's a wonderful school called Georgetown Day School. So I applied there and I got the job. I had, I had to interview and I had to teach a class, eighth grade, which is a very awful. difficult. <laughs> it can be awful, but it was wonderful. Yeah. I, I, it was fantastic. It was absolutely amazing. I remember I taught um, a Richard Wilbur poem, Advice to a Prophet, which is a, it's a fairly difficult poem, but these kids were fabulous. I get the job, Debbie. And then I'm signing the contract. I think this is going to be great. They tell me it's this is in 1980. They tell because I'm very old. Your audience should know. I'm I'm so over the hill you can't believe it. Not so at all. <laughs> so anyway, they tell me that um, they're going to pay me twelve thousand dollars, and all I have to do is I have to um, teach history, uh, coach the soccer team. I think teach history. Okay. Coach the soccer team. Well, my kids play soccer. I think I can teach. I think I can coach the soccer team, and teach remedial mathematics. Jeez. And my head went, I don't think so. I don't think I can do that. And I went back and I said to them, I don't think I can do that. You have to be really good at mathematics to teach remedial mathematics. So. Yeah. I then attempted, I had signed the contract. I had to get out of the contract, but they were, this woman, I cannot remember her name right now. She was so gracious. She said to me, this is the way we work. We're a small private school. And you are the kind, I, this isn't true really what she said, but it was a very kind thing to say. You are the sort of person who will always get the job. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you out of the contract. Yeah. So that's what happened there. And then I end up at a trade association and I do this sort of silly thing. They, they send you down to human resources. And once you, you know, once they've sort of decided, okay, I'm going to be hired as a junior editor. Mm -hmm. I figure, okay, I think I can do that. And they say to me, well, we'd like to know how much you want to be paid. And so <laughs> I, I said, well, you know, the Georgetown day is going to pay me 12. I want $14,000. <laughs> and they say to me, well, we pay our secretaries 20. So, <gasps> so you're like, ding, ding, you under, you under shot yourself there, right? Oh my okay. gosh. So we're going to pay you 22, which put me behind the eight ball for many, many years. Cause I kept getting promoted at this job, but I was already way behind the eight ball with that salary. Right. So that's, right. that's, well, I want to say something. I'm going to back up a little bit because in, in the beginning, before you started talking about these jobs that you went to seek after knowing that you were for sure going to be not in a marriage any longer and be supporting your children, you said, I'm old, I'm over the hill. And, you know, there's something I have said to numerous people, even like last night, Jill Haller and I were sitting next to each other. And I said, tomorrow night, Mary Tabor's on. And I want you to know 
that she's older than me, but I don't feel like she's older than me. She's older than me in biological years, wisdom and life experiences, but I feel like she's one of my friends, like the same age. You that's this is a great example you are to me of age like chronological years and the, the the your birth date and how many candles you put on a cake means very little to me if i have a connection with someone age doesn't matter and you are such a young spirit mary you are so young at heart and um you're fun and i and you're hilarious i mean wait so you start like letting it out and all that and before we move on, Julie, my friend, Julie, whom I introduced you to, Julie Brenning. Hello, beautiful ladies. Hello, Julie. Um, she's on the show or she's watching and Trisha. And I do not know how to pronounce the name of the lady that was just on. Persephone. Persephone um, used to be my Pilates teacher. Oh, and wow. For the British consulate. And Sean Benson. Hello, Sean. We've got a lot of badass women watching a badass women tonight. Let's go. Yeah, All right. So let's go back. Let's, let's have this little story time again. So okay. Okay. you're working, you're getting promoted like crazy. And well, then what happens? Well, wait, because this is what also strikes me. When you told all of us that you, before you asked for a divorce or got, did any of that, you went to seek a job first, which yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not so that, that speaks not, volumes about your personality. Not the smartest thing to do. But okay. you did, you know, you did. I don't get credit for a, for a, for a lot of smarts in some of my in some of areas of my life. Okay. Yeah, but I mean, you. But that's kind of like the person you are too. Like you're like, I know you can pay me, but I'm I'm can go get a job and I can be support. I can support myself too, which is what you did. I and was I was also worried that he might not take care of me properly, and I had some sense of that yeah. underneath. I just had a sense that it wasn't going to go well, even though he made lots of uh, wonderful promises that, of course, he didn't keep. But he's kept them to my children. That's what's most important. True. And that's what we that's what we care about. And we talk to each other and we see each other. And so we can, you know. Does he still live on the East Coast? He does. Okay. He does. And you, you also have a home. You're, you live in two different areas, so not, you're not, coastal, right? No, not anymore. Um, I, I was, I was living in Chicago for a while, and I was commuting to LA. It was very cold there, <laughs> and uh, and the winters were kind of they're tough. Those they're winters, aggressive. They're I got aggressive is a good word for very it. aggressive. Um, you can freeze your eyes in some of the weather that yes uh, so we we began to look on at LA because it's a place that both of us had I've been on book tour in LA and my husband had been out in LA for work and we in contrast to a lot of people who have a lot of not so positive things to say about the LA culture uh, we liked it, so we looked for a place. And then while we were out here, I was living in High Park in a uh, condo that is near the University of Chicago where a lot of professors live. And it's very popular among professors. It's very beautiful. It's on the lake. It's a co-op. And it's. I thought we'll, we, we didn't have it on the market. And I've, for sure, I thought we would never be able to sell it because co-ops have fees, things like that. It's complicated yeah. to sell them. It's very hard to do. And I thought it was going to be there forever. It turns out, Debbie, that the former president of the University of Chicago heard that we were in L.A. and called us and said, I want to buy your apartment. That's oh not my God. Yes. And it was during COVID. And over the phone, I think I was taking a Pilates lesson. And on the phone, my husband sold it. Oh my gosh! He came and asked me if wow. it was okay. But you don't. So you don't have a place in Chicago any longer. No. You don't. Okay. So where are your kids? Where? Oh well, we're going to get into that. Where does your daughter live currently? My, my daughter is a very prestigious professor. I'm so proud of her. She's a, her name is Sarah Hammerschlag, and she's a. Uh, professor of history of religion and literature at the University of Chicago. She's tenured. She's famous. She's just making waves everywhere with Good. all of this brilliance. 
she lives in uh, she lives in Hyde Park. No place to park and no place to hide. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Isn't that the truth, though? So, wow. I mean, you know, of course, she's successful. She has you as a mother. Right. She's gorgeous. Oh, she's so beautiful. You can't walk down the street with her without every head turning. Wow. And she probably stands tall and has a has confidence. You know, that's huge. That oozes out of people when when you have it, you can tell and it's attractive. I love that. Um, OK, so let's talk about how then you're a single mother. You have a full time job. Yeah. First of all, for other single moms out there watching, how did you handle all of it, Mary? There was a lot of crying. I have to admit that. I really didn't know what I, I've actually spent a fair amount of my life not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I did very well in school. And even then I didn't know what I was doing. I was often calling my father and saying, oh my daddy, daddy, I know I failed. I know I failed and I just took the test and I'm positive I failed. What this is about, you know, uh, one, one would say, has she seen a shrink? Yes, I have, okay, to answer that question ahead yeah. of time. Yes, I have. And he would say, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay, and then I'd get an A plus. So what, I didn't really know what I was doing. And I didn't know what I was doing while I was raising these two children, trying my best to support them and to give them everything that I possibly could. But parenting is a complicated process and we make mistakes and our children have a, do, often do a good job of explaining those mistakes to us. Yes. <laughs> They let us know. They do, don't they? Yeah. They do. And yeah, I, if you wonder, you're not going to wonder for long. They're going to they're gonna let you know. And I've listened. But I mean, I love, love your honesty, too, because clearly, you know, you're humble and you say, I don't know what I was doing, but you were so strong and you were doing it. Even the days you had to just go through the motions, you were doing it. And And I think another thing that you're saying right now speaks volumes too, because it's okay to cry. In fact, you should. I do agree with that. And I think people who hold, this wasn't grief exactly. Well, there's grief. There is, there is grief. When a marriage ends, there's a lot of grief. And I had tremendous sense of loss. I, I still think about this first marriage and feel as if I lost something that I wish could have been repaired. Mm -hmm. I tried. I really tried. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things just go awry and we have to find a way, as I said earlier, to move through. We have to find a way. We have to find a way. And so find we have the show, we'll find it. It's I know, we've got to find a way and we're finding oh, yeah. it right now. Oh, yeah. a way. But Mary, my thing is though, so how long were you single prior to like, well, did you date right away? Well, I, I'm curious no, about that. No, no, no. There really wasn't. There really wasn't any dating. And um, my husband is quite a story. I, ho I hope he's not listening because he <laughs> probably is listening. But there's, he's quite a story too. But in any case, I met him on the job. And oh, um, well, wait a minute. So let's stop here because you were, really didn't date any. You were so concerned. You know, you're working. You're raising your kids, and then you meet Dell, your current husband. Yes. And yes. this was a work, he, you worked with him. In fact, you were his boss. Is that accurate? Well, I, first he was my boss. Oh. And then at some point, at some point, Debbie, I became his boss. But it didn't last for long. They moved him out of the department. Okay. Um, but yeah. And actually the funny part of that story is that all the time, the people in the office thought we were, remember, we started with me being in charge of affairs. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, you had you had a front row seat in your first marriage, so I figured you were an expert in that too. Didn't I? Oh, that night like when he danced all night with her, I'll never forget. I'm sitting oh. next to her husband, watching my husband dance with her all night. Oh, that was fun. Oh. In any case, uh, in any case, I I hate that um. I said that um, and I said to myself, "There's going to be no ums in this interview." I do that. I tell <laughs> myself I'm not, and then I do. I'm with you, sister. That's fine. We're going to um and yum and. So what I was saying is that 
people in the office were sure we were having an affair when nothing was going on. We were forming a friendship. And then when something was about to be going on, we had broken up and we weren't seeing each other. And I was, I did then date other people. At that point I dated other people. Yeah. And eventually we decided that we wanted to be together. Actually, my children sat sat us down on the couch and said, we think it's time that the two of you got married. <laughs> it's true. I was serving him so many dinners that they 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 figured he's, he's nearly living here. Maybe and she's feeding him. Maybe he should maybe this should become permanent. And they really liked Dell. That's the good thing too. To know that your children really valued him as a man and what he represented in their lives. I think that's a beautiful thing. So that's amazing. So when they moved, so when you guys like really started for sure dating, he was in a different area. So you guys didn't actually work together any longer. We worked at the same place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we, we worked at the same lobbying organization, but once they, I was promoted to head of the department in charge of affairs. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Once I, was, once I, I, <laughs> once I was head of that department, they moved him. Well, he has lots of he has lots of skills. He's a chemical engineer. He's has an MBA in finance. He plays the piano. He's a really skilled person. And they moved him over to uh, another department where he could succeed. And then he eventually moved up in. We were equals, actually meeting at yeah. 845 in the morning at the same meeting. And so wow. I had my position, he had his position, and we were basically equals at that point. Wow, so I didn't, so cool. I didn't, Debbie, I didn't get to push him around very much. No, not long <laughs> enough, right? Right. Well, and I, I feel really blessed to have met Dell too, because he's a really great guy. Um, I just, so then you guys got married. Like, you've written three, three books or more than three books, Mary? Three. Three. And here they are that I've cropped and it's right between us. You guys can see the woman who never cooked re making love and not, who, what uh -huh. not what you think, not what you think <laughs> and who by fire. So tell me, and all of those books are available on Amazon and um, other website, other websites as well. You can Google the names if you guys want to purchase it. And Mary is also on Substack, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And it's scrolling along the bottom right now. But of those three books, which one is your personal favorite? My personal favorite is actually the short story collection. Oh, is it really? That surprises me. Why? I don't know. I just thought you were going to go with the one of your real love story the, the the memoir yeah i don't know no. why I, I thought in my mind i thought oh she's gonna pick that one i oh, like that one. i i like that book because it ended up as a series of what i would call lyric essays and that's a very odd term which may i explain that a little bit yeah please do yes so, I, I think it's frank o'connor in the lonely voice who says he was a wonderful irish writer and he says in the lonely voice, the writer is selecting and hoping for a new form. And sometimes that works. And sometimes it's a fiasco. And when I began writing about what happened and what happened is that after 22 years of marriage, my husband said, oh, so Greta Garbo, I need to live alone. If you can believe that, that's what he did. And he went away and sold our house and i went out to the university of missouri and took a um and and took a, a visiting writers visiting authors job and i began to blog about it that's a, a crazy thing to do for a writer and they were coming out as small lyric essays meaning that we're to refer back to what o'connor is saying if you're if one is successful at this the Associations that are made intensify the small, short clips of writing, and they become closer to poetry than prose in some sense. Mm -hmm. if successful. And I'm not saying I was successful, but they are a series of lyric essays. And I had writer friends who were 
calling me and saying, you're giving this away. What are you doing? <laughs> and a publisher picked it up. Oh, wow. Okay. That's incredible. But yeah, so just let's just make sure our viewers heard you correctly. You had a beautiful partnership marriage. And after 22 years, you guys went your separate ways for, for a little bit. And then what happened after that? How long were you apart? Well, it, it took about it took about four years, but that's the story that's in the book. That's and the story so that's in the I, book. Yeah, I really don't want to scoop that, but if you make me scoop it, I well, will. I the reason I, I mean it's I'll it's scoop it if you want a little bit because I mean you don't have to go because when you read the book, I mean it's detailed and you feel it. And I want you to give maybe just the cliff note version of what it was, um, because it's so important for us to know as women too. first of all, your life wasn't you were you grieved him. You missed him. You didn't want it to end and you didn't know what to do. But, but yet you got through that, too. So, see, we, we've we've seen a pattern here where you've made it through. But then ultimately you and Dell are back. You've been together. You're each other. You're together now. So I've married him twice. Yes. <laughs> he must be a winner, winner. <laughs> he has his own story. Maybe maybe he should write a book. I think he, he should. should. Yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't want to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I would say this, that um, first of all, I want everyone here to know that I was sort of a has-been before I became anybody. And I'm not sure that I am anybody, but that clearly I must be somebody because you have me on your show. Oh, you're, you're way somebody. So my first book was published when I was 60 years old. And, and that's the other thing, you guys, everyone that's listening, this woman... <laughs> published her first book at 60. I know not, not self-published. It wins a prize and it's published by a press. So it, 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 it wins a, a pretty significant prize and all the short stories. This is one of the reasons that it's so important to me is all the stories that are in the woman who never cooked, which by the way is, has a lot of cooking in it. All of them were published in literary magazines and many of them won prizes. So I just feel so fortunate that I met these editors at literary magazines and that that, yeah. that happened. But at 60 to begin a new career when, who does that? I don't. I know. I, and that's, I'm telling you, this is part of who you are that inspires me and that I need to. I needed Mary in my life. I was like, oh my gosh. And, you know, I, I, your story and the stories of your life that I know, and I haven't even, you know, touched the surface and I know more than what our listeners do, but my gosh, because you got to read the book. But um, I think probably even the bigger story here, if we have a bunch of people listening, it doesn't matter male or female, is that why do people think your life's over after 50? I don't get it because I, at 60, I started to internet date. And that <laughs> okay. And, and so I want you to know that at 60 years old, I went on J date and I was one of the hottest. Commodities on there. <laughs> I was a hottie toddy. Well, the thing is too, weren't you approached by younger men all the time? Absolutely. I couldn't believe it. I thought, do they have a mother problem? What's going on here? 35 <laughs> years old and they're asking to date me. One guy actually took the train down from New York, took me out to dinner and, and said, I want to sleep with you. And I said, sweetie, I'm old enough to be your mother. You need to go home. <laughs> it's not your bedtime. You need to go home. for dinner. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. But then, I mean, you know, the, the fact that you, you had a, the reason I, I say, and I believe this with my whole heart, you, you were, and are you, you were a trailblazer for women of in that decade who, you know, you went and had a high profile position that you worked your way up to. You were more than capable, worthy and able, um, and did it. And was, I mean, not to be like upset anyone who's listening, but you, you were the boss of a, a men. Oh, yes. And in that day, I, a, in the I, 80s, I was managing over a million dollar budget. I'm in charge. 
And then I quit. And my father said to me, okay, so at the time, Debbie, there was this book. It's not, it's not worth it anymore, but it's, it's called, um, oh, I can't, I, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, that's really strange. Um, but it's like, oh, who's who? Who's who in America? Mm-hmm. And now I think you pay to get in there. But at the time, I was in who's who in American women, who's who in the, in industry and finance, you name it. I was in I was in, in everything. And it's my father who sold insurance all his life and sees me as this enormous success is to me, Mary, what are you doing? I don't understand what you're doing. But the job had become a desolation for me. The mm. higher I got promoted, as crazy as this seems, the more money I was making, the more unhappy I was, and the more I knew I had to find a way to get out. And actually, I had some help with that. And I'd like to tell you that story if I have Yes. To do yeah, so. I want to hear it. So they send me away to management school and management school at the University of Chicago, where my daughter ends up as a professor. So uh, I go there, and there's this group of professors, and one of them is... Mike Chicksamahai, the that's a very complicated spelling. I can't spell it for you, but he wrote a book that probably many of your listeners have heard of or read, and he was finishing it at the time that I was there, and the book was called Flow. And it's a wonderful book. And I was sitting in the back. I was about 62 people who were in the management program that I was sent to before they were going to promote me to become director. And I'm sitting in the back and he asked this question, is there anybody who disappears inside their work? And I'm sitting way in the back to all these men, this maybe three women, four women and 60 men. And I my hand raised my hand a little bit. And he sees it quickly in the back and he says, Mary, when, when does that happen? And I said, when I write. The program goes on, it's a lot of training, a lot of tests. And one day I get this call that everyone on the, all the professors want to meet with me. I think, oh no, what the hell have I done? <laughs> You're I, going to the principal's office. <laughs> I, am, that's how I, feel. I am in trouble. I am in trouble. So I go up, they're all sitting around a table and they say, this is confidential. We know that when you go back, you're going to be promoted. And we know that you'll probably probably do quite well at it. But we also know from everything we've seen is that you are an artist and you need to find your way out. What am I supposed to do with that information? Wow. I had some indication early, long before this happened, this was in 1987. 1987, um, I'm Jewish and I was invited by my synagogue during the high holiday, holy days. Um, my, the rabbi invited three or four people to come up and talk about their recollections of the holiday. And I had written something and because my name ends in T, I was last. The rabbi was a real talker, by the way, so it's hard to, it was hard to shut him up, but I managed to do that. I had written something about my mother, and when I finished, he was stopped in his tracks. He, had, he was silenced, and after that, he takes a beat. And then there's, you know, a little get together afterwards. It's called a noting Shabbat and you go and you have everyone meet you and they say, oh, so you're a writer. And I said, no, no, I'm not a writer. I, I, I work at this corporate, at this lobbying organization and I, I'm not a writer, but I mailed it out, Debbie. This never happens. I want everybody to know this because this is important. If you're out there writing and you're sending out stuff and you feel discouraged, I want to say to you, this was just luck. I don't know why it happened, but I sent it out to the New York Jewish Week, which at the time had 250,000 subscribers. Mm. They not only took it, but they placed it on their op-ed page and illustrated it. Oh my gosh, I have chills. I didn't know this story. Wow. That happened in 1987 when my daughter was 13 years old. And so I had some indication that this is what I ought to be doing or should be doing or should be trying to do. But I had to prepare myself to leave. 
And so I began by taking courses at George Washington University where I ended up teaching. I taught there for over 10 years. I Yes, I did know that. That's impressive. So I took these two classes and then a remarkable thing happened of generosity. And one of the reasons I call my Substack only connect is I really, that's that, those, that phrase is the epigraph to Ian Forrester's novel, Howard's End. And I'm a big fan of Ian Forrester. That's the epigraph. And I truly believe that's the best advice I ever got is only connect. And here we are connected. Here we are. Here we are. Only connect. Yeah. That's the main thing. That's a, that's an impressive story. And so, yeah, I mean, do you have advice for writers of, you know, you're saying don't get discouraged if you're if you're putting things out. But if you really enjoy writing, it's probably pretty therapeutic just to to write, maybe not have expectations with what happens to the writing. Like, I don't know. Do you have advice for anybody that are writers that are listening that may get discouraged? I you know, clicked on that and turn up, turn, turn down focus or something. I see so get did you hear that noise? Yeah, I hear computer? it. Yeah. I, I, I I'm gonna try to do something here and put on focus and I'm okay. gonna try to do I don't wanna take time from anyway, anyway, let's hope that people don't don't text me guys if you're <laughs> listening. <laughs> She's a little busy, people. I, yeah. I'm I'm busy. I'm busy. Okay, my um Kenny Dillard has this line that a, a trunk in the attic remakes the world. I believe that. I believe that any body who's attempting to write is doing something that's creative that helps to remake the world. Don't be discouraged. Take my course. Take my course on Substack. Oh, okay. Um, you know what? I have very you need to talk about that. I, you know what? This is a nice segue into. I, I, you would think as your interviewer, I would um, have already plugged that. But yeah, that's true. You, you have a course on your stub Substack account. So I do. I have. That. There are other there are other sections to it, but there's one that's called "Write It: How to Get Started," in which I'm basically trying to give back. I'm trying to help others. And it's super inexpensive. You can do it for for five dollars a month, and they'll the total of it will be about seventeen lessons altogether. Yeah. And it's almost it's almost it's almost it's that that portion of my Substack is almost finished. But also, we have a new I have a new Substack that's coming out where two people on Substack found me, joined with me, and on Friday, February third, it launches. Oh and wow! It's called Inner Life. And we're inviting other writers who are doing interesting work on literature, culture, criticism, philosophy, music, painting, to come and join us. We each have a week, and we each write on two on Tuesdays and Fridays on that week. And then we invite someone to have their own byline and to come on. We hope to create a little hub of a community of writers, which is what Substack is. Right. Right. And so, um, my friend, Julie, was who was, my friend, Julie, who was is also on Substack, was on last week. And I thought it was interesting the way you guys booked in um, for the show. But um, and, you know, she her view of it, too, is really a platform for writers to express themselves openly and not have restrictions on what they're writing. So that's and it. and to be OK with to be reading, reading is, reading, it's kind of a desert out there in terms of people reading, I find. Yeah, you know, the, that's true. And, and one of the connections I've made on Substack is there are a lot of great readers of literature and of other things too, of criticism and philosophy and a whole range, mm -hmm. a whole range. But the process is one of learning through doing it's almost, I think, there's a philosopher I used to read quite a bit, whose name is Alistair um, McIntyre, and he has this example. He says, if you're starting to play baseball um, and you don't accept that others know something better than you do about how to pitch, um, then you'll never 
appreciate or how to, how, I think he uses the example of how to throw a fastball, that there's some others who know better than you how to throw that fastball. If you yeah. don't realize it, you need to, you need to learn something from those who have gone before you and who yeah. can give you some advice, then you'll never actually learn how to pitch. Oh, and see, this is why, like, I, I, just, oh my gosh, this, you're, you're talking my language because, you know, and I don't, I mean, you know, I don't have beautiful quotes like that, but just from my Debbieisms and how I talk, it's like, I want to put people in around my life to inspire me to be better. I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. In fact, I, you know, I know I need a lot. I have a lot to learn. Me and, too. And, and the fact that I'm connecting yeah. with you and all these other people. It doesn't stop. The older you get, the more you should realize, the more I've realized how much I need to learn, not how much I know. Well, I want to know, like, okay, so you do Pilates. I do. And you guys, I've met her in person and, and she has built like, uh, this is just, let's just be real here, okay? Like you're one hot tamale. Oh, and you are. And um, and I never ask a woman her age, but I do know how old you are. Do you want to tell everybody how old you are? I will turn 77 in March. OK. She's built like amazing, but she does Pilates. She's highly intelligent. She reads. She writes all the time. You know what I mean? My grandfather used to tell me. Can you, know, you be mother? Can you be my mother? I think I need you to adopt. me. <laughs> I need you to adopt you. But my grandfather always told me he goes, Debbie, just like you want to keep your muscles strong and you work out and you want to keep, you know, your body strong and healthy. He said, you have to use this. You have to read, you have to do crossword puzzles, whatever you want, but you need to keep your brain working. It's like cardio reading and writing or, and you know, the puzzles or whatever. It's like cardio for your brain. If you don't use it, you lose it. And I always remember him saying that. And it's not like, a, it's not, he didn't coin the quote. People use it all the time. But coming from him, and he was 95 years old at the time, who was still driving, the head of the Senior Citizens Club, very with it. I'm like, well, if he's telling me that and he's hanging out, at, you know, running the Senior Citizens Club and still driving, I probably ought to listen to him. So, like, with you, I'm like, well, she's successful. She's smart. She's beautiful. You know, all of these things. I want to learn from you. I have a lot to learn still. And I think, you know, like you say, you're still learning. None of us, the day we think we know it all, forget about it. Okay. I'm going to introduce something now. I don't want to scare you or anybody else, but um, uh -oh. what's the happening? <laughs> the worst thing that's, that's happened to me in the last few years is that my son, Benjamin Hammerschlag, died in 2017. And that stopped me in my tracks. There he is. Oh, my goodness. What a gorgeous man. Very. And um, I want to keep him alive in my heart. And um, I want to find a way to find my way back to the novel that I'm trying to finish. One of the things I did, I'm, I'm going to read a tribute to him if you'll if you'd like it. I'll read I, it. I would love for you to. And I'm going to pop this up here, too, because this is me at your house. And you're showing me um, his photo, and I believe it was a, a tribute to him, and also he owned a winery. Yes, in Australia. In Australia. And this is something that Dell had made for you and put it in the wine rack. He was he was world famous and a friend a friend of mine. Actually, I think this is the I think this is the framed piece that a friend of mine, who's a journalist for the Wall Street Journal, I won't name her name, but I think she actually sent this to me. This may be the one she sent to me, or it was another. Well, that might have been another one. I'm not sure whether that's it. But in any case, I think this is when he was named best under 35 in food and wine, and he was world he was world famous, but he did die, and. That stopped me in my tracks. And I'm going to read this tribute to that I wrote to him on what would have been his 48th birthday. My grief for you is like the ocean and she speaks to me. Here is what she says. I stand on a wave above you. I am dressed in a chiffon dress that mirrors the sea you, your son loved. So it is not sky blue, it is green blue. Some days as green as his eyes that were sad, that saw what was coming, that couldn't over overcome, but tried. 
though I pull you with the flow of my long black hair in an ocean of wind, and though you think I pull you into the sea that you will drown, you are wrong. You will float on the chiffon of my dress as the waves crest and fall, and you will rise like the sun that you have seen behind my form. Then she is silent. Here is what I say. I did not know that love may speak in waves of silence. I know that you, like me, were lost and searching through an unknown passage, that you too have felt as if you were drowning, that you too have had, have not had a lifeboat. I have learned that comfort lies in this not knowing and that you are there for me, that you are here with me in some ineffable way that I sense each morning that I wake. I see you in the fire of the sunrise, in the sky streaked among gray clouds. And on that sunrise, I see you in fast cars that fly on fires in the sky. Oh my gosh. I just thank you for sharing that with us. And I also have a son. I have a daughter as well, like you do. And, um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. You, I know you get through things. You have to, you go through the motions, but I also know that you had told me to my face. And I remember appreciating this, that you want to talk about him. Absolutely. Yeah. The silence that surrounds grief in our culture, I think is awful. Yeah. We don't help each other by abandoning the person who's grieving and who needs you more than ever. Yeah. Um, so what advice do you give to people that, I mean, like, did you have to explain to your friends and other maybe family that it's okay to bring them up and in fact you encourage it? Or how do you handle that when you feel alone? Mary. It's hard because people are particularly uncomfortable with the death of an adult child. They say, I can't imagine it. And indeed, I understand that. But that also leaves the person who's grieving me in this case, often alone and isolated. And I have, I have felt that, but I did a, I did a really odd thing. I began to play the flute if you can believe that, it's probably not. I, I totally believe it, Mary. Of course, you decided to start playing. <laughs> you know what? What am I going to do in my grief? I'm going to just pick up a new. I'm going to start playing instruments. I, 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 I took I took online lessons and I began playing the flute. So I'm just trying to find my way through, as I keep saying. And 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 in what you have written for him, you do see him in the sunsets you do see him in the way of the, the water. And you do, I mean, you know, that's also a nice reminder too, is that um, you feel him around you, don't you, Mary? You feel him around you. I, I do. I, I wake every morning and I really think of both my children. And so they're, I thank goodness my daughter is well and successful and I'm so thrilled for her. And I know that she carries this grief too, because yeah. this is her brother. So of course she has her own difficulties to deal with this, but we have to find our way. I keep saying it. It's a fine. It's, a, it's, it's Debbie's find it. We need to find our way through. You know honey, I find myself saying find it all the time. And it's usually, I got to find it. Cause I'm always freaking looking for something, but yeah. it makes me laugh because, uh, of the name, how often I do hear people say it and it does stick, but you know, you do. And I know that you have, and that you, do you have a community of parents who have lost their children that you connect with or no? No, I, okay. I don't. I did, I did try that for a while, but I didn't find it to be as helpful as I had hoped it would be. And now I, find some, I find, I found you. Yeah. I was able to talk. I'm able to talk to you and all these lovely people who may be listening. Yeah. And just to be able to do that 
makes my heart swell. And I send that heart love out back to all of you. And I feel it. I can feel that love, Mary. I want to talk about real fast. I um, had asked you when I was at your home and I want you to share this. You have very successful children and yes. you know, well, I, I, and I, uh, I had thought, gosh, you know, worldwide famous. I have two worldwide famous children. Worldwide, I know fa- literally like top of their field um, and famous. And I often think about the women who um, for many years and you were a single mother and, you know, you were managing everything. And I asked you, Mary, what did you do that you think, I mean, what was one of the bonding things that you did for your children? Or I think even, I think I just asked you, what do you think you did differently than other mothers to just have, you know, for your kids to have this confidence and uh, overachiever success? And you said to me, what? I can't remember exactly what I said to you, but I hope that my children believe that I listened. And you said that you listened and you heard them, but you cooked. And I did, I did cook. And both my children, my daughter is a fabulous cook. My son was a great cook. Uh, but, but I think that I learned from my own father that to listen to one's child is the greatest gift one can give that child. And to not impose on that child an idea of what the child should be. We Mm. all need to choose our own way. And we need to listen to that too. Yeah. When the child says, I want to do this, I want to be this, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do this when I grow up. This is where I want to go. This is who I want to be. Mm. One needs to listen and not say, I want you to be Mm -hmm. what you know that parents do that sort of thing. And that's just goodness. Don't stop. Stop it, guys. (laughs) That's that's my line for today. Stop it, guys. Stop Stop it, guys. Yeah, knock it off, right? I mean, and and I think there are times probably where you love your kids so much. And if you think they're going down the wrong path of what you think, but I guess the lesson here that you're saying is, yeah, but it'll be their lesson. It'll be their path to find their way. And if we constantly tell them what they should be doing, that's them trying to go on our path. True. That's well said, Debbie. I just, it's, uh, you're inspiring. Can can you please adopt me? I'm going to adopt you. See, and that's what I mean. Age is just a number. I'll take care of you. I am. I I like to mother people, Mary. So I I will mother you too. You just give me the green light. I'll be right over. That's why this show is so good. Because Uh, I love it. I love it. But um, I. You're You're a generous soul. Oh, well, I appreciate you. And okay, so we've gone a little a little over my, but I could just listen to you forever and pipe in like I chime in. Okay, the show's called Find It. We've just, we've established that. <laughs> so um, in your life, my gosh, you, you've gone through a lot. You have books for sale. You've got Substack that people can tune into and get to know you better. And if they want to be connected to a writer's um, lesson, they can find you on Substack and it's been rolling the whole time. You guys, if you want to check her out and she makes it so reasonable that everyone's welcome and it's manageably, it's fairly priced so you can do it. Um, but what I want to ask you is in your life, what have you found that you can share with us to help inspire us to find it too? Actually, I'm thinking of something that's not original with me. I'm going to quote something from a movie I saw. I hope I get the quote right. It was this movie, Queen to Play, about chess. And in the movie, this chess play, I believe, I, hope I, this right. I believe she says, when you take a risk, you may lose. When you don't take a risk, you always lose. Mm. Mm-hmm. Say that again. 
I hope I'm getting it right. And someone can correct me if they know the exact quote from Queen it's to Play. It's fine. You just say it like it's so true. When you take a risk, you may lose. When you don't take a risk, you always lose. Life is full of dangers and finding our way at moral dilemmas and finding our way through is risky. But we need to move forward and we need to find our best way to make those choices and to live as good a life and as empathic and compassionate life. For instance, let me just, I know we're running over, but let me just say this no, it's very fine. quickly. No, it's fine. Okay. okay, so I think that the term pity is, is you know, I, I wrote, I spoke about my son having died and I'm sure there's some people who are thinking, oh, I feel so sorry for her. Pity is a word that is majorly misunderstood because the components of pity are mercy and hope. And when you feel compassion for someone else's loss, you are giving them mercy and hope when you reach out to them. Mm. Do it. Mm -hmm. Find it. Find it. Find it. It is, it is scary for people to feel like it. And it is even for me. And I feel like I'm a social person and I'm very empathetic and I feel for people, but like, I never know what to say. <laughs> and it, it's like, it just, uh, you know, and it makes it awkward, but you just maybe just don't say anything. Just give someone a hug or just listen. You know, like or, you, the advice you gave for your kids, you or, just listen. Or take out their trash for God, for goodness sakes, you know, come yeah. over and just, and just be present. Don't say things mm -hmm. such as he's in a better place. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Okay. No, thank you to that. Yeah. And, and, and otherwise, and otherwise, remember that creativity remakes the world and that anything that you do, anything that you make in whatever career you're in, every time you do something that comes from your heart, and I'm sounding a little bit like Oprah now, <laughs> don't mean to, but okay. um, is, uh, every, any time you make that choice, you are remaking the world. You are holding, holding us up. You're holding all of us. Your thoughts count, creativity count, you matter. Yeah. You, you, you froze a little bit, but your message is loud and clear. And I want to, you to know that I appreciate you coming on and I appreciate the person that you are and um, the quote you used about finding it and what you have found is you've lived that life. You've taken the risks and it, you know, you walk the walk, Mary, and I'm so grateful to know you and to call you my friend. And um, is you there anything? Such, you are such a pleasure Aww. that I need to give back to you and say to you from my heart to yours, what you have done for me today has given me hope and courage. Mm -hmm. I thank you. Oh, Mary. Well, you're very welcome back at you. Oh, my heart is full. I hope you all enjoyed this. And I know you did. There's a lot of value in this. Um, I could talk to her for hours. So with that, Mary, I adore you. It's the first day of February. It's all about love. I'm wearing red. Um, and what the best way to kick off the month of love than with Mary Tabor is what I'm saying. So have a great night, everyone. Mary, stay with me for a minute. Have a great night, everyone, and I will see you again the same time next Wednesday on Find It. See you guys. That floats around me, keeping me 